Well, thanks very much, and thanks uh, for the invitation to be here. I, I sort of felt like a bit of a ring-in because Chris is a uh, Turkey specialist. I, I first went to Turkey in 2004, and I've been back many times to follow it closely, but not as a Turkey specialist. Um, I, I'm a Southeast Asianist by way of my original work. Um, and put it in context for tonight's discussion, the first half of my career was spent looking at uh, contribution of progressive Islamic civil society groups to democracy and the second half has been spent looking at terrorism. Kind of an un unhappy combination really, I'm <laughs> trying to get back to democracy but I, I went to Turkey and I followed Turkey with that interest in democracy and I think, um, uh, you know, we sort of, when we talk about Turkey, um, we, we, we take uh, knowledge for granted and I think for some of you it's, it's very much familiar but for others it's perhaps not so obvious that there was, in Turkey, a real effort to try and engage with the AKP party uh, for the first decade uh, of its um, of its governance it, it really did seem to be consolidating democracy um, people who had reservations about some aspects nevertheless thought this is the best bet I mean for all of Republican history in Turkey you never had a party that could get a near uh, majority of the vote um, so there was stability uh, there was the backing of initiatives for reform that would enable, uh, facilitate the uh, bid to join the, the EU um, and that led to a lot of progressive um, reforms, um, human rights reforms and, and other progressive reforms. It was taking place in a context in which uh, Turkish demography was being transformed quite dramatically. So you had a lot of people from smaller towns and villages moving to larger cities. Istanbul in particular, as Chris said, who knows how, how large greater Istanbul is, um, even with inside the city limits, but then it stretches outside the city limits, and it's a city that grew um, with, um, with, with, as the saying put it, with constructions thrown up overnight that were later legitimized. Uh, part of Tayyip Erdogan's claim as a reformist mayor was he ratified legal uh, possession to many of those um, uh, quickly erected uh, apartment blocks and, and gave people a sense of legitimacy who had moved in from small towns. Of course, you'd imagine in a, in a place like Turkey, people moving from small towns tended to be more religious and more socially conservative. Uh, and and uh, Tayyip Erdogan was seen as mayor, as representing that. And so when um, the Refah Party um, uh, was forced to uh, uh, leave government after a kind of soft military intervention, a so-called, um, there was three hard coups, this was a soft coup. Um, uh, our party sort of emerged in a surprising fashion uh, but with much promise. It, it, it came out of Refah Party was seen as representing um, political Islam, so that's to say Islamist politics, uh, politics that sees religions playing a role in, in politics. Um, in, in Turkey the expression Miligurush was used to describe this kind of religious politics. Uh, and Turkey, more than almost any country you could imagine, is very polarized to the point of being neurotic. I mean, this is back before developments of, of recent times. Uh, but so lots of divisions left and right uh, across ethnic and, and, and uh, other divisions but certainly between religious and secular uh, but with AK Party it looked as if you had a, a party that would because of this democratic shift a, demo, a demographic shift with people moving from the country to the city um, and um, uh, that being a larger section of the population there was a population growth having been previously neglected by other parties uh, feeling that it had a place with AK Party so AK Party was able to get a, a, a near uh, plurality of the vote and they would have the stability that gave it the, the, the chance to do reform and because it was bridging this world of the secular and the, and the religious of small town conservatives and uh, and modern uh, cities there was a real sense of hope about that whole project um, I think a lot of people were always concerned about uh, uh, Tayyip Erdogan because he had come out of this Mili Gurush Islamist tradition um, but many of the people who were with him in AK Party um, didn't share the same views and some of them in fact had very different, uh, much more progressive views. So the, the thought was the combination uh, was, was the best hope that Turkey had going. And, and you know, from my perspective, uh, looking on uh, probably more from the outside than, 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 than um, uh, Chris, because I, I don't speak Turkish and I, I come in as an outsider, not as a specialist, I was looking at the larger picture and saying, well, uh, for those of us who look at Islam um, carefully and look at Muslim society, we know that the simple formulation of the likes of Samuel Huntington about the clash of civilizations uh, is not correct. But the, um, it, it's not the case that Islam is necessarily antithetical to democracy. And yet, if you look at the evidence, 
uh, a quarter of humanity, 1.7 billion people, um, living for the most part in Muslim majority states, some exceptions like India, uh, with the world's second largest Muslim population, but as a, as a large minority and, 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 and suffering some, some difficulties. But you know, a, a band going across the middle of the world from West Africa, across the equator, uh, through up into, um, into uh, West Asia, Central Asia, and, and down through South and Southeast Asia. Um, looking across those countries, 56 or so countries, um, and looking at the uh, index for good governance and democracy, the, the situ situation is, is pretty abysmal. I mean, how many democracies do you have? Um, how many cases of, of good governance do you have? If you allow for a fact that uh, a country like Singapore, perhaps with one party, is not really, despite its title of being a um, socialist democracy, is not really socialist or democratic, no. but nevertheless delivers good governance. China, uh, of course, is not a democracy, but China delivers good governance. And in that same, in most areas, not many areas where there's reasons to be concerned, but if you look at the sort of big picture of health and education. Um, so to be fair, looking today at, at monarchies in the Middle East, uh, Morocco, uh, Oman, uh, Jordan, uh, looking at the UAE, we don't have democracy, but we do have good governance. Um, so, okay, that's a fair qualification, but still, the level of good governance across the Muslim world and, and the level of, uh, of uh, democracy is, is pretty abysmal. So, it was countries like Indonesia and Turkey who offered this great hope. And this was a, a, a feeling felt very intensely within Turkey. So, um, in civil society, and the largest civil society network was this, um, this movement that that calls itself the service or the hizmet, but, uh, but which is known because it, it um, is inspired by the ideas of uh, Fethullah Gulen, who has lived um, the last 17 years in Pennsylvania, um, and so is, is in English often referred to as the Gulen movement. But that, that movement, a, a religiously, con um, socially conservative, um, uh, in some respects religiously progressive movement that um, uh, was very much involved in education, very much involved in media, along with other civil society movements thought, well, we'd we better get behind the Ak Party project because it's the best thing going, both for Turkey and, and really as, a, um, a, 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 as, a, as an important Muslim-majority state uh, pioneering democracy, democratic consolidation. So where are we today? Well, um, when uh, that mysterious coup occurred on July 15, um, Tayyip Erdogan was outside Istanbul. Um, he was... Um, uh, on holidays, he flew back in his um, government uh, Gulfstream uh, corporate jet. Um, he was tailed back on his flight back by two F-16s. Uh, there was a lot of speculation about whether that was an aggressive uh, uh, shadowing or, or a protective one. Uh, but anyway, he landed safely in, in Istanbul, and as he got out of that Gulfstream, he said, well, you know, this is a gift from God, because now we can purge the military. Um, and immediately he swung into action with a purge. Um, and, and clearly, you know, as they say in the cookery shows, here's something I prepared earlier. Uh, he clearly he prepared this, <laughs> this purge well in advance. Now, you may have noticed uh, just recently in the last week, German and other European intelligence agencies are indicating um, that they think that Erdogan and his inner circle had good knowledge of the coup well before it occurred. And as, as Chris said, it was a, a pretty half-hearted half I mean, it really wasn't a serious attempt. You didn't, they didn't do the things you're supposed to do with a coup. So uh, it doesn't seem to have been a regular military coup. Um, you could go to one extreme and say, well, it was just constructed uh, by Erdogan's team as, as a pretext for a purge. There's a middle ground position that says they had some foreknowledge. There was a lot of disquiet within the military. Uh, they allowed it to run because they wanted to run this, this purge. Bear in mind that um, Erdogan... Um, in a country that's very polarised, it has always been a polarising figure, but he was able to get half the country on side, uh, and the only real block to his power was the military. So if he was ever to be taken out of office, it would have been a military coup. And the post-coup purge has basically eliminated that threat. Um, um, almost half of the serving general officers, the, the flag officers, admirals and generals, have been purged. Um, we have today, in terms of people being purged, 95,000 people in detention, half of whom have been formally arrested and charged, but the other half not. Uh, you have um, 135,000 people, roughly, who have lost their jobs and been purged, and for most of them that means that they can't find other work. They, they lose, if they had government housing or cars, they lose that. 
if they turn up on a construction site as a labourer, um, their construction site uh, managers told to get rid of them, otherwise face consequences. So they're, they're sort of persona non grata in their own country. Pretty, pretty awful thing. It applies to many dual nationals. So, you know, for example, a, a story recently in the news was a, an American uh, NASA astronaut who happens to be a dual national was back in Turkey, was arrested on some spurious grounds. His his, uh, his brother had a $1 note which was said to be a sign of a conspiratorial <laughs> arrangement. Anyway, uh, it, it would be, uh, it's so bizarre you could almost not make it up. But it's very tragic consequences. Um, and it, it means that today Turkey doesn't have an independent judiciary or independent legal fraternity. It's been sort of 3,000 plus uh, judges and lawyers arrested. Um, many academics, every single academic dean was sacked. Um, um, thousands of academics uh, sacked, many of them detained um, on, on trumped up charges. Um, no real free press, I and mean, Chris was talking about reading the press recently in February, but you know, it's, you've got press that's sympathetic to Erdogan and one or two token others, but not that, that dynamic free press that was there before. The Gulen movement had uh, some serious involvement in the press that was quite dynamic. So today, Zaman, you may have read in English or, or Zaman in, 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 in Turkish, some in old television, other uh, initiatives. Um, which were notable because they came at a time when there wasn't any, or there wasn't much in the way of non-partisan press. So, uh, in a country that uh, didn't have a broadsheet tradition or a, a BBC type, uh, ABC uh, television tradition, they provided that to a considerable extent. They were sympathetic to AKP, they, they weren't particularly critical of Erdogan, they justified that by saying they, they thought that um, this was a project worth supporting, but that's all been purged. All those assets have been taken over, um, many millions of dollars, several tens of billions of dollars taken over in assets. So it's a quite a dramatic thing. Um, if Erdogan gets the yes vote uh, next month, it will give him, I'm okay, Chris is right, the 82 constitution needs to be changed. But the new constitution that's been proposed would give to Erdogan, um, as he says himself, as his own team says, you know, there can only be one driver of a car. Other people say, well, you know, jet airlines actually have two pilots or more, because that's a good idea with a complex system. Um, but anyway, so there should only be one driver's seat, one steering wheel, one driver. It would give him the authority to appoint judges, generals. Um, um, it would give him the authority to um, uh, determine who was appointed. If he, would, he would run the AKP, AK Party. Um, he would have unfettered control. In, in rough shorthand terms, uh, if Tayyip Erdogan gets a yes vote next month, he'll have the same powers in Turkey that um, Vladimir Putin enjoys in Russia. It's, it's, it, in fact, there's a sense that he looks to Putin as kind of a role model. Um, that, that should be pretty scary. So um, by my assessment, uh, whichever way you look at things today, democracy is no longer functioning in Turkey. Okay, there's, a, there's an emergency rule period. That's true in, 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 in France, as Chris said, but in France, they're going to presidential elections next month. Um, the judges, the press, they still operate independently. We don't like having an emergency rule situation, but it's a pretty light touch. In Turkey, emergency rule means there's already one man in charge, and if you go against him, or your neighbour reports you as going against him, then there really is this post-coup um, purge witch hunt mentality. You get locked up. It's, it's, it's pretty tough. If he gets the yes vote in the referendum, um, then that's, that's ratified formally. And um, in, in crude shorthand terms, you've seen what was the most promising democracy in the greater Middle East turn into just another Middle Eastern dictatorship. Now, you could argue whether the word dictatorship is too strong, but I've thought about this a lot, and I, I think it's very hard to argue that Type Erdogan is not already acting like a dictator, and the powers given to him next month will confirm that. So it's, I, mean, I know there's a strong, strong statements to make. Um, but I think objectively there's, there's reasons for saying that very critically. His recent behaviour, um, trying to manipulate sentiment um, amongst the Kurdish, yeah, the Kurdish the Turkish diaspora in, uh, in uh, the Netherlands and in, in Germany, um, not so much because he needs their votes, although there are millions of votes available to him there, but more because it, it energises his base back at home. He's the, he's the champion standing up against uh, the horrible West. Um, uh, it's, it's been very cunning and almost artful, uh, if rather heavy-handed manipulation. So he said the minister, um, who was wearing a hijab uh, and therefore looks, looked to be very non-threatening, to speak at a, at a pro-yes referendum vote in Rotterdam, the Dutch government decided this was not the time to allow her to, to speak, given that they, they recently had their own election. They thought it was, it was poor timing and it wasn't appropriate. That was turned into a, um, a sense of outrage in Turkey, which I think played into uh, everyone's um, concerns very well. Um, the same thing, Germany has been very restrained about criticising uh, Turkey, um, but um, Angela Merkel has been increasingly um, 
more sharp in her comments and, and has taken a firm line in the meeting with Erdogan. And as I said, recently German intelligence has, has sort of let it leak that they, they, of course they were monitoring what was happening in Turkey uh, in July last year. Turkey is the second largest NATO military, um, so there are concerns about uh, Turkey as a NATO power, there are concerns about ISIS uh, to the southern uh, borders of Turkey with uh, Syria and uh, Iraq. Um, there are concerns about the thousands, uh, the, the millions, uh, the tens of millions uh, potentially in terms of everything going badly wrong, but certainly at the moment three million um, uh, uh, refugees uh, in Turkey coming out of, out of Syria. Um, if things went badly wrong in Iraq and the, the, the situation deteriorated, you'd have a much larger number of refugees. But Turkey has, um, in some respects, been gracious. I mean, you can look at some of the details, it's not always that nice stuff. Front, but but, but um, the threat to Europe has been if you don't give us the money to look after these refugees, we'll let them come your way. Um, and of course, there's concerns about the fact that um, there has been a real rapprochement between Moscow and Ankara. Um, you might recall in November 2015, a uh, Russian Sukhoi was shot down uh, over northern Syria, southern Turkey. There's a little finger of land that uh, peninsula that jutted into Turkey. Or well, sorry, that. Um, uh, the, of Turkish territory that governed into Syria. Uh, this Sukhoi allegedly overflew that. It was shot down. Um, uh, the time Prime Minister Gould boasted that he'd given the order. Um, uh, as it turns out, um, they then wanted to shift the blame. Russia froze all aid, uh, froze all um, trade, froze significant Russian tourist flows. And then in the middle of last year, there was a sudden rapprochement. Uh, Erdogan went to, to Moscow. Um, uh, when the uh, alleged coup attempt occurred on July 15, Moscow was the first to speak up and, and defend um, Turkey, and uh, they've been very close ever since. It's led to a strange situation in Syria where um, Erdogan's stated goals of getting rid of Bashar al-Assad, a former friend, now a rival, and somebody he really wants personally to see out of office, um, and, and to limit Kurdish um, uh, military activism in the north of, of Syria. On both those grounds he's had to concede, he's got little to show for it, but he's had Russian backing at home. And so it's, it's a strange dynamic. But for all these reasons Europe was reluctant to criticise um, uh, Erdogan and his government, his regime you might say now, and has gone very sort of gently, gently. I, I think the Australian government's done the same thing, I don't blame them. It's, you know, the, the, with a, a major NATO power it was always more important to try and hold things together than, than to disrupt things. But what it does mean now is that um, that holding things together seems to be falling apart. Um, the, the, uh, the Dutch and the Germans are becoming more openly critical with justified grounds. Uh, after this vote next month, which we expect will one way or the other end up giving Erdogan what he wants, uh, you can expect a lot more open criticism. Uh, whether uh, Turkey would leave NATO is another question because it would be against their interests. And, and Erdogan, to give him credit, as it were, has always been um, uh, very instrumental in his politics, so he may, may sort of change tack and, 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 and remain within NATO. Uh, but that concern about ISIS remains. There's not time to go into the details here, but um, it's significant in explaining my interpretation that I've spent half my career looking at terrorist movements to, and, and now the other half looking at, uh, or at the same time looking at civil society reformist movements. Um, objectively, I can't see how the Gulen movement can be described. There's either an Islamist movement, much, much more a terrorist movement, but what is very clear is that um, uh, over the period since the outbreak of civil war in Syria uh, and the intensification of the ISIS problem, uh, there has been some overt and a lot of covert exchange between Ankara and, and ISIS. Um, um, one of the uh, things that has put Erdogan on the defensive was major corruption allegations that came out after the unrest of the Gezi Park protests in December 2013, the Gezi Park protests in the middle of the year. In December 2013, he and his um, his family uh, were accused of being involved in deals that would uh, see um, Iranian gas sold in exchange for, in exchange for the gold, circumventing um, sanctions. Um, later on, it, it became clear that there were significant amounts of munitions and, and explosive material going from Turkey into, um, into Syria and into Iraq. Um, it was justified on the grounds of supporting anti um, Assad militia, but it does seem to be a very clear collusion. When the Sukhoi was shot down, the Russians responded by releasing satellite imagery that showed long lines of trucks coming from the Turkish side queuing up to fill up with oil, which strongly suggests it's not a few bandits sort of you know engaging in smuggling. It's actually something with state sanctioning. Um, so uh, one of my concerns is that as ISIS is driven out of Iraq and, and Syria, or at least out of the major cities, and, and, and perhaps as a remnant presence in the countryside, 
we will see thousands of, of, of genuine terrorists in, in Turkey. And uh, perhaps in the discussion we can get into, if you're curious, get into some of the issues about um, why ISIS has only claimed one attack in Turkey, even though uh, its fingerprints are over more than a dozen. Um, it, it did claim that January 1 attack, which seemed to be kind of a warning sign to Ankara. Um, but it, it didn't claim, for example, the Istanbul airport attack. And it, and it seems as if there's a strange relationship. I suspect Erdogan thinks that he can use ISIS as a force uh, that he can control. I think he's wrong in that. Um, I think there's also a level of ideological sympathy, which is a very uh, strong statement to make, but I think it's, it's, there's chilling reasons to think that's so. Certainly we've seen dozens and dozens of ISIS um, uh, terrorists arrested in Turkey and only to be released within days, which suggests a very strange going on. Um, there's not the transparency. So I'll finish my comments here by just saying that my view, which seems excessively bleak and harsh, is that we have seen one of the most promising democracies in the Muslim world tip over into authoritarian rule and then tumble into um, uh, personalised authoritarianism, which has taken on the attributes of dictatorship. And that will be ratified next um, uh, next month uh, if, Turk if, um, if the country votes yes towards the so-called reforms. Uh, and I, I don't think the people voting yes understand what they're getting. But you know, if you if you concentrate so much power in the hands of one man, even though that one man drops dead of a heart attack and is replaced by another man, um, it's just an unhealthy dynamic to have that sort of constitution. So I'm, I'm very sad for Turkey because I, I uh, have always enjoyed my many trips there and, and uh, appreciate Turkish hospitality. And there seemed to be such promise in a country that had such a difficult uh, Republican history. And it's very hard to be optimistic about how things can recover. Now, maybe I'm missing something and maybe uh, things will be resolved, but it, it, right now it seems as if 15 years of hard work and progress and consolidation of democracy has been wiped away. Uh, we saw the signs beginning with the Gezi Park protest in mid-2013. There were some earlier warning signs. Um, the last few years have been pretty full on. After uh, Erdogan not getting the result he wanted on the July, uh, sorry, the June 2015 um, election and going to a runoff election in November, there were signs of heavy-handed intervention, and um, and and all through last year that was very evident. But after this so-called coup of uh, of July, um, there's been a very bizarre situation. I can't explain the coup, but what I can say is the post-coup purge uh, doesn't stand any scrutiny in terms of, of what's reasonable or fair. And, and we now are living with a, um, a dictatorial situation, which doesn't mean that life in Turkey is intolerable for most people, but it does mean that it has the potential to, to get very badly worse. Uh, and it's hard to see how Turkey will find its way out of this. And I, I wish I could give you some sort of more optimistic spin, but um, I think we're, we're sort of, we've witnessed a disaster that will be a very long time in recovering. And, and uh, that's of concern, not just for Turkey and anyone who has an interest in Turkey, uh, but for everyone who's concerned about what happens to one quarter of humanity and the future of democracy in the Muslim world.